Boker Tov. Good morning. It's a nice, cool day over here in South Florida. And we're ready to learn. We're ready to study. Baruch Hashem. God has given us another day, another week, that we could come together and study Torah. We always begin with a mitzvah. So let's begin with the mitzvah of tzedakah to bring forth blessing in today's Torah discussion. So... <clears throat> Here we go. Let's make a bracha on the delicious coffee that Hashem has uh, blessed us with. You can answer Amen or make your own blessing, even better. If you have your own coffee, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Sha'akol Niyah Bidvaro. So this past week, Torah portion, we read about the famous story of the Akedah. The story of the Akedah is where God tests Abraham. To use the language, let's see if I have a chumash, if I have a Torah here handy, uh, within reach. Oh, here we go. Here we go. And uh, so here we have the Torah. And let's read the first words of the Torah here when it describes to us in Parshas Vayera the story of <coughs> the Akedah, of the binding of Isaac. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, I'm here. We got it. We got it. We got it. Don't have to wait much longer. So here we go. Okay. By Yehiachar Hadvarim, my Elo was after these words. Velakim Nisas Avram, and God tested Avram. Vayomer I love Avram, and God said, Vayomer I love Avraham. God said to him, Abraham, Avraham, Vayomer, and he responded, Hineni. Here I am, and as Rashi says, the term "hineni," here I am, has is is a is an expression of humility, of of acceptance. I am yours, God. Whatever you ask of me, I am ready. This language "hineni," there's even songs been made, is is become the uh, a uh, sort of a role model and a strength for all of Abraham's children, the Jewish people. And all those inspired by Abraham, that when God calls, we answer and we respond, Hineni, here I am, I am ready. And God continues and he says, Vayomer, and he says, Kachna is bincha, take your son and bring him as a, as an offering, as an offering to me on Mount Moriah. I mean, I'm just giving you the shorter version. This is not the actual language here in the verse. Then the Torah says the following. It says, Vayakam Avraham, here, let's go, the page is a little hard, it's very thin paper over here. Vayashkem Avraham, this is verse number three. Vayashkem Avraham Baboker. Avraham got up early in the morning, meaning even though God, even though God said to him, bring your son up as an offering, <coughs> Avraham did not, Abraham did not, push it off, but he eagerly woke up early to take his son as a offering for Hashem. In fact, there's one, there's an interesting commentary. I'm jumping around here a little bit before we get to the main focus and theme of today's discussion. A few, uh, um, a few paragraphs, a few uh, verses further, we have like a very strange, a peculiar uh, interaction between Abraham and his son Isaac. But here it says like this, as they keep on walking, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Aviv, and Yitzchak said to his father Abraham, Vayomer Avi, and he said to him, Avi, my dad. And here again, Vayomer Hineni Vini, and he responded and says, Here I am, my son. What's this expression? What is what's going on? Here? Various commentaries. What does this mean? He said to his dad, and he said, "Dad," and he said, "I'm here." And one of the explanations given, just as a side note, to highlight the the, the depth over here of the commitment of Abraham to God, and also Isaac sensing what's going on. One of the commentaries says that Isaac says to Abraham, to his father, "Vayomer Avi." Are you still my father? That's the question. Meaning, it's not just a 
introduction to what goes afterwards. He says, where is the sacrifice and so on, but it's a question in its own right. Abraham, you agreed to follow what God says. We have sometimes people, they go crazy. They go Meshuga. Unfortunately, they take their life. They take their children's life. They, their mind went berserk. Their mind, their mind is blown. So th this is what Isaac is asking. You, Abraham, who are the most loving and dedicated father, are you still my father as you're doing this? Or have you gone Meshuga, we would say, in the, the vernacular expression of you God Meshuga, and that's why you're doing this. And he answers, No, he neni vini, I'm still here as your father, and as your father, I'm willing to do the most difficult thing and follow what God tells me. Now we know the end of the story, you know, all is well that ends well. God doesn't tell him to actually sacrifice. He just said, All I told you is to raise him up because I wanted to see the depth of your commitment. And you pass the test all, you know, with flying colors, and we're all good to go. And this was just a test. Now, and getting back to verse 3, it says over here, by Yashkim Avram Baboker, Avram woke up in the morning, by Yachvosh Es Chamoro, and he went ahead, and he saddled his donkey. He harnessed, he saddled his donkey. Now, we know that every single thing the Torah tells us has reason and purpose. Why is this even important? And he saddled his donkey, obviously. And Rashi tells us that Avram, in his excitement and his anticipation to follow God's command, God's request, even though it involved giving up in his mind his dearest child, Isaac, did not pass on the saddling of the donkey to some of his servants that he had, but he did it himself as being exciting, excited to fulfill this mitzvah. <clears throat> so, what do we have here so far? We have God, as the Torah itself uh, describes this as a test. God says, I mean, the Torah says, elokim nisa es Avram. And God tested Abraham. This was a test to see Abraham's commitment. What was the test? That he should offer up, up his son. The God used a language that was a little ambiguous. So to Avram's mind, it meant to actually slaughter his son. Later on, God says, I didn't say slaughter him. I just said, raise him up, which can mean a sacrifice and can mean just to raise him up, put him on the mountain, raise him up. Now that you've raised him up, bring him down. <clears throat> I mean, one of the obvious questions, which is a general question, not only here with Abraham, what does this mean God tested Avraham? Give me so as Avraham. You know, you give a child a test, you give someone a test, a driving test, a test in college, in class, to know where the individual is holding. What's their knowledge level? What's their skill level? God knows it all. What does this mean that God gives a test to Abraham? What for? We say God tests us. Why is he testing us? And this is a very general, common, a very general question that's discussed. Various answers given. We're going to touch upon that, but we're going to get a little sort of more deeper, a little more interesting into this discussion based on or <clears throat> leading in with this also very strange medrash, what's sometimes called as a medrash plea, something that would needs the man's explanation. The medrash on verse three, when we talk about the fact that Abram saddled the donkey, by Yashkem Avram, Avram rose early, and by Yachvosh es Hamoro, he saddled the donkey. So the Medrash tells us, <coughs> in addition to the answers just given, the answer provided before, the Medrash tells us this following thing. Listen to this statement. The Medrash, I'll read it in the Holy Hebrew, and I will translate. The Medrash tells us, Miyom shenivra ha'olam, from the day that the world was created, lo'ihaya adam shechavash hamoru. There was not a man that saddled his donkey, Achabav, Ramavin Olav Shalom, until Abraham came. Medrash tells us uh, some very strange piece of news that from the day God created the world, the first time we find in the Torah, Vayach Voshet Chamoro was with Abraham because nobody else saddled their donkey until thousands of years after creation when Abraham came and saddled his donkey. What does that mean? That, that's a, a very strange medrash, a very strange statement. And besides, why is that important to know? What, 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 what information, what insight, what lesson, what depth 
what angle is it is it giving us that that we need to know that information so to to get to the bottom of this i want to i want to further complicate or further uh share some further insights that have been the medrash which makes it even more surprising and more and more uh peculiar the medrash says that this one and it's also mentioned in the Pirkei Avot, that this donkey this donkey that Abraham used by yachosh at chamorro was actually created at in at, at the six days of creation the Pirkei Avot also mentions chamorro shall uh, <coughs> at the chamor that was used by Avraham Avinu. This was also created at the beginning of creation, and there was this donkey that somehow survived and was there for Avraham Avinu when he performed this test of the Akedah. And not only that, later on we find in the Torah that Moses, when he is asked by Hashem to go ahead and redeem the Jewish people, he brings the Torah, tells us in Exodus that over there he takes his wife and his children and he puts them on the donkey. The Torah, the Medrash tells us this was the same donkey. Taking this even a step further, the Medrash tells us that we are told that when Mashiach, which is the ultimate purpose of creation, will be revealed to the entire world, it says he will be an Oni, he will be appear as someone who is poor, and somebody who is riding on a donkey, this is the same donkey. What does this all mean? By the way, in general, medrash, not often, it's often not to be taken literally, but more as a, as a deeper insight, a deeper realm of holiness and understanding and truth, um, <clears throat> which we're going to try to uncover over here in today's discussion. L'chaim, l'chaim. I hope you're still with me over here in this in, in our discussion over here and you haven't been lost. So let's talk about what this donkey represents. By Yachvoshet Chamoro, he saddled the donkey, a whole big tumult, a whole big tadil about this donkey and Avram saddling the donkey. What does this mean? State in Hasidus, it says in Hasidic teaching in Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, that the Chamor over here has a much deeper significance and meaning. Chamor in Hebrew means a donkey. Chamor also means coarseness, humrius. God created the world. When God created the world, it says, Va'aretz hota tohu vavod. The world, the earth, was in Yiddish we translate, pustin vist, was desolate, was empty. And then the Torah in Genesis tells us, Ve'ruach elokim, and the Spirit of God, merachefet, was floating upon the water. Ve'ruach elokim, merachefet alamoyim. Says the Medrash, what's this Ruach Elokim? This is the spirit of Mashiach. What does that mean? In everything, everything we have, we have its, 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 its creation and we have its purpose. The purpose is how the creation comes about. When you create something, you're building a home, you need to know what is the purpose. You're making a, a car, whatever you're putting together, you have to know the purpose, correct? When God created the world, he created it in a certain way, but immediately the purpose of creation was already part of that creation. Simple, right? The creation of the world, the world, the word, word the word world in Hebrew is olam. Olam is also related to the word helam, which means concealed. He created a world where holiness, godliness, and its purpose is actually concealed. But immediately, immediately, the spirit of Mashiach is hovering upon the earth, upon the water. Why? Because the purpose of creation is after all the work and all the toil and all the uncovering that we do, that is what the spirit of Mashiach is, where the world will then come to its ultimate purpose, where all the covering and all the concealment is removed, and as the prophet says, every flesh will see, ki pi Hashem dibe, that the mouth of God is, is what's talking and sustaining the world. That is the purpose of creation and the toil and work of what we are doing throughout history. 
in to give it another terminology, that's what the chamor represents. Chamor represents not only gashmiyut, which means materialism, physicality, but the coarsest of physicality. When something becomes not only neutral, but it actually becomes so, for lack of a better word, you know, Yiddish has a way of expressing things. In Yiddish, there's a term called fagrept. It becomes so coarse, it becomes so self-absorbed that any holiness, you know, I don't know <laughs> if any of you have seen, you know, there's all these little video clips that go around. So there was a, a video clip that went around on the WhatsApp groups, including the Jewish WhatsApp groups, of this 12-year-old um, influencer that's interviewing Mike Tyson before the fight of yesterday. And uh, you know, Mike Tyson is a Brooklyn kid. You know, he's from, he's from my shtetl. I believe he's from Brooklyn. Sad story, the whole story of Mike Tyson for, for us uh, Brooklynites over here, for fellow Brooklynites here listening to this class. And uh, so, he sh so she asks Mike Tyson, you know, what is the legacy that you want to leave? Something, something to that effect. And he responds, I mean, well, how old is Mike Tyson? Now, 58, 60? And he responds to this kid, what are you talking about legacy? There's no such a thing as legacy. We live, we're born, we live, we die, and we rot, and nobody else cares about us, and, why, and that's all. You're just here to enjoy whatever life you have. There's, there's no purpose, there's no legacy, there's no nothing, there's goodness. Stop, just enjoy life, and then it's all over. That's, um, <laughs> that was the content sort of of his answer. So that's, that's one way of looking at life. Of course, the Torah way, the godly way, the spiritual way, and there are so many reasons why that is so off. But, but you know, Baal Shem Tov says whatever we see in here is supposed to be a reminder to us. You know, these things make us think so that we understand that, yes, there is a purpose to life, and there is a purpose to creation, and there is a soul that continues to live on, and there is a legacy, and there is what we are a role model and pass on to our children, etc., etc. So the Torah right away in the beginning says, yes, there's darkness, but there's Ruach Elohim. That is the purpose of creation. So, represented in Hamor. Hamor means where the coarseness of the world has gotten so difficult and so concealing that it's beyond just neutral materialism, but it, which can be used in any way that the person chooses, but it's become even more coarse based on ideology, based on indulgence, the more you indulge, the more coarse you become, and so on. And what does that mean that Avram Avinu was the first to saddle the donkey? It means that since Avram Avinu was the first one who recognized God on his own and started the process which led later to Moses giving the Torah to mankind and then ultimately to Mashiach, so he was the first one who saddled the donkey who started to transform that coarseness represented in the chamor. Hasidus also explains how it relates to a physical donkey, but we'll, we'll leave that for now. But, <clears throat> so that's the connection between the chamor of Avram Avinu, the chamor of Moses, who took it to a whole new step with the giving of the Torah, which gives us the instructions, guidance, inspiration, know-how of what and how God wants us to take the chamor of the world and transform it into a uh, into a transparent um, entity, a trans transparent material where we see the creator and the purpose in that chomer of the world, ultimately to the chamor of Mashiach. Let me explain this uh, 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 or with a beautiful story that I read. This Friday I was reading a Dvar Torah that was shared by the renowned Rabbi Simon Jacobson. <clears throat> so he shared the following story. In his article, he gives out a weekly article. I think you go to meaningful.org, I think, meaningful, meaningfullife.org, I think, or .com. And uh, Rabbi Sima Jacobson has a lot of beautiful, insightful uh, articles, lectures, and so on. So he shared the following story. He says, as a lecturer, he was once asked to come for a Shabbaton in a, a little town. Although he doesn't write this in the article, but I'm going to surmise that it was probably a Chabad house. And uh, so he was asked to give a lecture Friday night and then Shabbat by day, and there was a Shabbat meal. And he says, I noticed that there was a fellow there, sort of a big, strong, you know, healthy, muscular-looking fellow, 
who was very um, helpful in serving the food and making the guests feel comfortable. He was inviting whatever needed to be done. He didn't wait to be asked. He noticed on his own. You know, you have you have those who come and they're and they're there to help. They're there to roll up their sleeves. He also noticed that during his lectures, he was listening. He was paying attention. He was asking questions. And uh, for you know, we'll, we'll, we'll name this fellow. We'll name this fellow uh, Mendel. I don't know if Mendel. His name was probably not Mendel. We'll, na we'll name this fellow. He gave him a name. We'll name this. We'll name this fellow Yehuda. Okay, Yehuda. And so Yehuda was was like really into it in a very sincere way. So at some point, Rabbi Jacobson says he asked the rabbi, the local rabbi of the synagogue who was hosting this event. He said, "Who who is this Yehuda?" So he said to him the following. He says, "This is his story." His story is that he was in the Navy for quite a number of years. And uh, after he left the Navy, he, he he had sort of a spiritual awakening. And being Jewish, he, he wanted to find out about his roots, his origin, his, his tradition. And he developed a, a, a strong hunger for Torah, for Judaism. And that's how he made his way here. And he takes his learning seriously. He's, he, he, he's, he, he's thirsty. He's thirsty to learn and to learn. And he's sincere. He wants to help and so on. And then he shared <clears throat> the following sort of detail about this Yehuda. It's a fictitious name, but he says, this Yehuda, struggled with uh, with something that we had to sort of consult with an with an experienced rabbi on this issue what was the issue he says while he was in the navy uh, he basically covered his body in tattoos that was what they did the the uh, sailors and some of his friends and his, his social group and now as he's becoming closer to Yiddishkeit, to Judaism, he knows that tattoos is forbidden in the Torah. So he did whatever he can to remove whatever tattoos he could remove. But there are certain tattoos that he just couldn't remove. Amongst them was, is a tattoo that is on his muscle, on his biceps, where he puts on tefillin. And the bigger difficulty or... An additional difficulty, I don't know if it's bigger from a halachic perspective, but the additional difficulty is that the tattoo that he decided to put on his was an immodest and inappropriate tattoo. So in his dedication and commitment and love for his return to his, to his roots, to his Jewish roots, he also committed to put on tefillin every day. And he was very disturbed because, first of all, he was disturbed whether it's called a chatzitza. A chatzitza is something that is an interruption between the tefillin and your, and, your, and your body. There's not When you're putting on tefillin, it can't be anything interrupting. It has to be upon the, the hand, as the Torah says. Nothing is allowed to separate between. In the halachic term, it's called a chatzitza, separation, an interruption. And he was concerned that this tattoo is considered an interruption and he's not fulfilling the mitzvah of tefillin. And what equally or maybe bothered him even more was that it's an inappropriate picture. So he's putting the holy tefillin on the picture and he's seeing the picture every time he raises his arm and um, it's affecting his thoughts. To have pure and holy thoughts while he's putting on tefillin and going to daven. So they consulted with a halachic expert on the matter. And the halachic expert told him that it's not a chatzitza halachically since uh, you cannot remove it, so it's become part of you. You did not do it in the beginning. You did not do it. When you did it, you didn't do it with sort of sinful intentions because you didn't know any better. But now that your desire is for it not to be there. So in your, so no, no, spiritually, in a sense, it's not there because you don't want it to be there. 
And halachically, by Jewish law, also you cannot remove it, so it's not considered a chatzitza. This was the answer he received. And when it comes to davening, and your intent on intention or kavana, your meditation, your connection to davening, totally put it out of your mind and, and connect. And he ends off, the rabbi ends off telling Rabbi Jacobson that not only <coughs> does he sort of put on film every day, he also goes to the mikveh every day to bring a, a, extra pur purity to himself, to his body, to his soul, and so that nobody else should be exposed to that impure images or that the inappropriate images. He goes to the mikveh at five o'clock, excuse me, at five o'clock in the morning when nobody else is there. That's when he immerses himself in the mikveh and gains that extra purity that the mikveh ritual bath brings upon, upon ourselves. So what's the story? What is this? What is this? What, what are we seeing over here? And as it relates to our conversation, our discussion, here was a person. <clears throat> we all have physical bodies, right? Materialism. That's who we are. That's how God created us. But here, a person took his physical body and created it into a chamor, in a sense. He added coarseness. He added. He added concealment. He added a layer that even further conceals the holiness and the potential holiness of our of our physicality. However, it is that very Homer and the transformation that he, as a result, every single time he davened, he had to deal with that challenge, connect more deeply to the ability to pray. So what do you think happened here? He actually transformed that chamor. He actually saddled that chamor for holiness. And in such, he actually brought greater holiness. It became transparent to the holiness that actually broke through. Which is why the Torah tells us about the chamor by the story of Abraham who God tested. Hasidus Kabbalah tells us, and also classical commentaries tells us, God doesn't need to test us. We ask, God tests us. He doesn't know where we're holding. The word in Hebrew for a test is nisayon. There's other words for it, for testing. There's bechina, lifchon. But here the Torah uses the term nisayon, nes, which also means to lift up. These tests, these tattoos of our life, these blotches in our life, these concealments in our life, which represent both spiritual shortcomings, failures, um, just life's, life's traumas, are there. You know, today, today, <clears throat> um, there is a great emphasis and we've had this discussion. There's a great emphasis on, on childhood trauma, on, on difficulties uh, that a person has. And some of them are real. Some of them are real. But the Torah's approach in general to, to any of that is that don't let it define you. Don't let the tattoos of life define who you are. Like Yehuda, who could have said, I have tattoos. This is who I am. I don't have the ability to raise myself up abo uh, above that. The traumas of life, the failures of life, the setbacks of life, the, the, the sinful transgressions that we have unfortunately engaged in, these are all obstacles that Hashem puts in our way. What we mean that these are tests is the word nisayon. They're there to bring us, to bring out from with, within us a deeper strength and level that our soul has which are underneath and beyond and deeper and more part of our essence of who we are the tattoos are an outer layer and hashem sends us these tests sometimes we fall through sometimes we don't but even if god forbid we have those tattoos of life that's not that what should define us yes we might have to get help whether it's psychological whether it's spiritual from a spiritual counselor, from a rabbi, from a psychologist. But don't ever think that that's who we are. On the contrary, nobody goes through life without having 
some form of trauma in one way or another. But these are there to lift us up. That is the chamor, vayachvoshet chamoro. Those are the tests of life. Those are the realities. This is who we are. <clears throat> you know, there's a very, there's a very uh, strange interaction in the Gemara in the Talmud. Chaim, Chaim. The Talmud tells us, talking about this statement, that Mashiach will come riding on a donkey. <clears throat> so the Talmud tells us that there was one of the rabbis often mentioned in the Talmud was one of the great rabbis was Shmuel. His name was Shmuel. So <clears throat> there was a king during that time, Shvur Malka, the Gemara refers to him. And the Shvur Malka, the king Shavur, asked, um, he asked Shmuel, he says, why a donkey? I could provide, you know, a healthy, sort of military, strong horse that would seem to be more dignified for Mashiach to arrive in this, this beautiful muscular horse. Why a a donkey? And Shmuel responds, he says, but our donkey that Mashiach will arrive in will be of a hundred colors. This is the discussion in the Talmud. What, is, what does this mean? This answer of Shmuel is so uplifting to each one of us. Let me explain a deeper perspective of what this discussion between Shmuel and Shavur Malka, the king Shavur, of how it is understood within the context of our discussion. In the Talmud, often when it says a hundred, it's similar to when we, you tell your child, I told you a hundred times. It means so many times, more and more and more. What, Sh what Shmuel was telling Shmuel Malka, yes, a horse is naturally beautiful. Usually it's naturally beautiful. That's what a horse is as opposed to the donkey. But let me tell you what our multicolored donkey represents. It represents the struggle and transformation of every single one of us, you and I. But we have our chamor. We have our chamor and what it represents, our coarseness, our obstacles, our challenges, our traumas, our stains. And we then do our part in transforming our world, and which includes somebody else who is struggling, that we could raise up and help them overcome their struggles and their challenges and their obstacles and allow them to see the God's hand in all of this. Allow them to see that this is a test from Hashem to raise us up higher, to remove the veil of its outer appearance, the tattoos of life in its outer appearance, but to see deeper of what the purpose of all of it is. And then we use that and dig in deeper to the strength that we have been given because that's its whole purpose. Only, it has no objective onto its own. Like when the creation of the world, immediately, the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God is over, hovering over because that is the purpose of what it's all about. That is every single one of us when Mashiach comes, which is when the purpose of all of this will come to fruition and we'll see it all. Your color, your individual struggles, your challenges, which you have, which I have, will be part of that donkey. Can you think of a more beautiful donkey? That is the most gorgeous donkey. And this is what's so beautiful about this. You as an individual are not just some by chance happen to be like, like Mike Tyson says, you're here, you're gone and so on. No, your struggles and your efforts and your work of removing the tattoos of the life and the world to look deeper into the beauty of it all, which is all from our Creator. That is part of the donkey of Mashiach. It's incredibly uh, comforting, inspiring, uplifting. So may Hashem help us as we are collectively throughout history, adding our colors. As a generation in this last year, we've added another sort of painful and beautiful color at the same time. May we actually merit to already reach that purpose that the prophets talk about, that the Torah talks about, already from the first moment of creation. As we say in Yiddish, and it's already enough with all the struggles that we've had, both collectively, individually. They would merit to see that most beautiful represented in the multicolored donkey. 
But all that beauty that has been created as a result of all those individual and collective struggles may be, at this point, is already high time that the, the promise of the, of the prophets should be fulfilled in the most simple and most open way so that, as the prophet says, there will be true peace and no more wars and no more death and no more strife and so on. May it be so speedily nowadays. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these words of Torah as to uplift both you and me. Have a wonderful, fantastic, blessed week.